Coming up on show 515, EVs forced to make fake engine sounds, Tesla's final delivery push, and the new Mercedes plug-in. Well, those stories and many, many more. We're talking about new Bentley concepts, Germany extending subsidies, and the new electric motorcycle also on today's podcast. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Wherever you're listening in the world, welcome to EV News Daily. My name is Martin Lee, and I go through all the EV stories that I can find across the net, across the press releases that I'm sent, across the blogs, and I try and distill them down into at least 20 minutes. But if we can... 15 minutes of EV news because I know your time is precious. Well, thank you as always to myev.com. They help make this show happen. They are the world's first marketplace all about buying and selling and learning about EVs along the way as well. If you're in the USA, make the most of myev.com. I'm loving their articles lately on how you can make the most of owning an EV and educating yourself on how to buy an EV. Their latest blog that I've just read is called The Electrified Pickup Trucks that are coming whether the market wants them or not not looking at things like tesla truck and rivian and many more as well well thank you very much if you have left a recent review of this podcast online or maybe on itunes or even on facebook hello to peter osborne on facebook who says it's a good mix of stories including tesla and leafs not just his zoe which plays a minor role up to date with uk and international stories every day incredible for a one-man show yes it's uh well I wouldn't say it's hard work because it's it's not that hard and let's face it this isn't really work but yes it does take a lot of time to put this podcast together but ultimately if it saves you time well then that's mission accomplished and hello to Luke on Facebook as well after listening to your podcast for the past year I finally did it I just bought a used 14 plate BMW i3. You're the first person I'm messaging about this because I'm probably going to be made fun of for the rest of my life for this, but it did feel good plugging it in. Thank you so much, Luke. Hey, Luke, why would someone make fun of you for buying an all-electric car? Maybe you're hanging around with the wrong people. You know what I'm saying. All right, let's kick off with some noise news. It's a bit of a tongue twister. One of the things that I like most about driving my EV is how quiet it is at low speeds. On a nice day with the windows wound down and at low speed, I find it relaxing to be sitting in silence. But now new laws all around the world are coming into effect that are adding fake noise on the grounds of safety and I do understand this one even if I don't like it more than once I've been driving around a car park and I've been following people walking to their car maybe they've been walking down the middle of the car park and then they've suddenly realized one woman jumped out of her skin blesser she just sort of turned around and clearly out of the corner of her eye she caught a car behind her and maybe she thought it was traveling faster than it was it was just me but I didn't want to hoot my horn because well, that's kind of rude. If I'm in a car park, like I can wait five seconds for someone to clear the way. I'm not in that much of a hurry, but it scared the life out of her. And also I've had cases in car parks where people have walked out in front of me because they weren't expecting a car to be there because they couldn't hear it. So they're relying on their ears to hear the car. I imagine I imagine it happens in places like car parks because people aren't being as vigilant. If you were crossing a three-lane road with cars doing 60 miles an hour, I'm guessing you would be a little more vigilant and you'd use all your senses. Well, now today we're facing noisier EVs. It's happened in the US and it's happening in Europe as well with a brand new law that comes into effect to help the visually impaired. This will certainly help those close call situations that I've talked about. EV models in the European Union now require a noise-emitting device. Uh, They're called AVAS, Acoustic Vehicle Alert System. The AVAS kicks in whenever the vehicle is driving below 12 miles per hour. That's 19 kilometers per hour. The system will theoretically prevent pedestrians and cyclists from being caught unawares by cars that would otherwise be near silent, reports Engadget. All new EVs, including those from existing lineups, are going to have to have them now from 2021. Cars already on the streets are going to have to get retrofits. However, as a counterpoint, I would point out that at speeds below 12 miles an hour, a recent piece of research showed that petrol combustion cars at very low speeds without revving their engines, are almost as quiet as EVs. Really, it's just a very faint noise of tyre noise at slow speeds. And even then, you can't hear the tyres on the tarmac. Therefore, 
people are saying EVs are being unfairly singled out and unfairly punished against the fossil cars, which make barely any more noise at those very low speeds. Look, I'm going to put a link in the show notes to that story if you want to find out more. We love luxury EVs. I love luxury EVs on this podcast. Not that I'll ever get to own many of them. Uh, However, Bentley are a name synonymous with luxury, and Bentley is celebrating its centenary in 2019, and now the company's teased the centrepiece of its celebrations, a new electric concept car, the EXP 100 GT. Uh, This is according to Evo magazine, the high-performance car magazine. Uh, Well, details remain scarce before the concept's official reveal. That's going to be on July the 10th, so only 10 days to wait. Uh, But the technology is expected to be borrowed from cousin cars, the Porsche Taycan and the Audi e-tron GT. They are both two premium EV models on the new platform called the J1 platform, and that's mooted to be shared across the Bentley model range as well. Well, as such, the EXP 100 GT is going to be powered by multiple electric motors. You can presume they're going to be driving all four wheels beneath what would be a sleek four-seater body as well. I'll put a link to Evo in the show notes. And mentioning the Porsche Taycan there, by the way, I did see some news today that the Taycan has been pictured pretty much without any camouflage on on the streets this time, not the Nürburgring, not bashing around a track, but just on public streets. And the car looks good, but they're still sporting. They are still sporting those two big silver fake exhaust pipes. All right, Porsche, you're fooling nobody now. Get rid of them. Car looks good, by the way, and not long to wait now until the Porsche is in the hands of customers. I think by the end of this year, isn't it? I should uh, go and check my dates on that one. Well, back in, it would have been February of this year on this very podcast, I was telling you about a plan in Germany to extend their EV subsidies beyond June of this summer. Uh, They call it the environmental bonus. Then, in May, we talked about the scheme being extended. That was for pure battery electric cars and plug-in electric cars as well. That was going to be extended until the end of 2020 and to kick in immediately after the expiry of the old one. And, of course, today is the 1st of July, so right on schedule. And, of course, we are talking about the Germans here. Nothing wrong with the good old national stereotype. Bang on time they have a new subsidy in place. News from Electrive.com today brings us news that the purchase premium for electric cars and plug-in hybrids has been officially extended until the end of next year. And there is new news as well. The extension of the environmental grant is going to apply from today, 1st of July, after the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy announced the details back in May. Well, what's new is a conveyor module for the installation of what we were talking about at the very top of the show, the AVAS, the Acoustic Vehicle Alerting System. Uh, They're going to be subsidised to the tune of €100. Battery electric cars and fuel cell vehicles are eligible for €2,000 each by the state and by the manufacturer. So it is a subsidy, nothing to do with your taxes like it is in North America, and that's great news. Well done, Germany, doing what they can to encourage clean, green transport. Let's talk about motorcycles. Let's talk about electric motorcycles. Shock horror. What with this being EV News Daily? And Husqvarna motorcycles have launched their new model. The EE5. The EE5 is an electric engine mini cycle that continues the brand's pioneering motocross journey and delivers a complete and fully adaptable 5 kilowatt competition machine. It's set to rival any other 50cc fuel powered motorcycle. Uh, The quick charging bike, the EE5, combines the latest high quality componentry uh, with bodywork specifically designed to give young riders uh, what they call an ergonomically effortless all electric racing experience. Well, the first ever electric model from Husqvarna was the EE5, and it's giving youngsters an environmentally friendly way to learn about bikes, to compete on bikes, and have fun on bikes. 
easily adaptable. The ride height can be simply adjusted to keep pace with an improving rider or a growing rider. Anyone that's had uh, their parents buy them school clothes that were too big for them and been told, you'll grow into those. It, this is a bit like that in bike form. Uh, you'll grow into that, don't worry. Uh, delivering two hours of riding enjoyment for beginners and 25 minutes for serious racers who are properly caning this thing. Uh, the supply charger will take about 70 minutes to charge the battery in full. It's a 5 kilowatt motor, 6 different ride modes, 907 watt hour battery on a lightweight bike. Great for kids and great for youngsters getting into bike racing and now doing it in an environmentally friendly way. I'm going to pop a link in the show notes to the Husqvarna Motorcycles website where I found this press release. So let's talk about Tesla's end of quarter delivery then. I was going to put it first in the news, but it's not really new news. Everyone knows it's coming. And there's actually really nothing to report because we won't get the numbers really until Tuesday or Wednesday. For the last eight reporting days, so for the last eight quarters, Tesla have always released the numbers either on day two or day three after the end of the quarter, uh, regardless of whether they're working days or holidays. So we know if past form is to go anything by the last eight end of quarters, it's either going to be Tuesday or it's going to be Wednesday, but it'll be one of the two. And that's when we'll get the numbers of how many cars the company shipped. Without wanting to reopen this debate about taking Tesla private, something which frustrates me. Uh, from the perspective of being an outside observer, not being a Tesla owner, not being a Tesla shareholder, just reporting on the news, as I do on this podcast every day, it's the high-pressure focus on Tesla delivering as many vehicles as possible every quarter. And the resulting movement of the share price, the resulting headlines on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whenever the numbers come out, the, the real impact that it has on the business. We heard from people from across the business, from not just the delivery specialists, but many people from many disciplines being drafted in over the last few days to really help that final big push, except it's not the final big push. It happens every single quarter, and it's just there really as a result of it being a public company. And I can't help but think if it were a private company, the sheer kind of delivery hand over hell, if you like, where people get worked into the ground for because they want to, because they believe in the mission. 40,000 people all behind the mission at Tesla, I should say, by the way. No one's, no one's being forced, I imagine, against their will to do this. But still, oh man, I, I find it frustrating. Am I alone in this? Uh, let me know your thoughts on any of the stories, by the way. I always invite your feedback because I really am just one person and one opinion. And there are uh, you know many opinions to be shared. And you might have a different viewpoint on this. Will it be a record quarter though? Whatever the result, some media will report it as being Tesla missed the target or Tesla narrowly hit the target. But either way, either way, even if they hit the target that Elon set, you can still spin this to be a negative headline, right? Well, this time around, they've got China and European deliveries to add in. On top of their goal of 33,000 deliveries in North America in June alone, the best guesses online put this quarter at 60,000 North American deliveries, potentially 90,000 deliveries worldwide. And when I talk about how the media are already setting up Tesla for a fall, the minute that the quarter was over, uh, today, within hours, a CNBC report was on TV that I caught, and they are... CNBC have at times been more critical than others, I think. I'm probably being pragmatic by saying, choosing that choice of words. They were already setting up Tesla for a fall by admitting, even if they hit it, they'll narrowly hit it, and hey... It's not really about deliveries. It's about this other thing. Have a listen to the clip. We should point out that if you listen to the analysts, almost all of them say the same thing. Sure, they may deliver 90 to 100,000 vehicles. That might give the stock a bit of a, a bump. But the real focus is on profit margins and how much those are going to be uh, eaten away at even further as they report Q2 earnings later this month. That's the expectation. It might be early in August. But that's the number that people will be focused on. The delivery number, most are saying they're probably going to come in close to 90,000, maybe a little above 90,000 in terms of total deliveries and 74,000 on the Model 3. 
So yeah, even if Tesla smash the deliveries, do a record-breaking quarter, deliver more cars than they've delivered in the entire history of the company, CNBC setting up uh, the company there to go, well, it's not really about deliveries, is it? It's about profit. When they've spent the last three months saying it's all about deliveries and then going, oh, well, they're going to move the goalposts a bit. I'm not picking on CNBC, by the way. It's a general narrative around Tesla that I find really curious And from my little old position here from the UK, thousands of miles away from where the cars are made, I get frustrated. And like I say, I'm an impartial observer in all of this, not being a Tesla owner. Moving on then, and let's talk Mercedes-Benz. According to a report by Autocar, Mercedes-Benz insiders and an official German Transport Authority document has now revealed that an A250e variant is going to be added to the A-Class the hatchback range. And if that last letter looks familiar, it's because it's the suffix that is added to electrified Mercs, like the C300e, says the UK version of the automotive website motor1.com. Well, the A250e will be powered by the same 1.3-litre turbo petrol engine as the A200. Now, that engine can deliver 161 brake horsepower. Add in the electric motor, which is added into the gearbox system. That adds another 101 brake horsepower. The battery on this, I think, is a reasonable size for a plug-in hybrid. 15 kilowatt hours. Now, a 15 kilowatt hour lithium-ion battery under the rear seats of the A250e gives a fair old punch of performance, but it'll also give you 37 miles of pure electric range measured on the new WLTP test cycle, which some say is still a little optimistic, but we'll go with it. Uh, Also, Car added the official German Transport Authority documentation indicated that in EV mode only, it'll do 87 miles per hour, which in this country is almost license losing territory. Okay, you wouldn't get the full EV mileage if you were doing that speed, but still sounds like a great compromise car for anybody not ready to go full EV, but they do want a car with a plug on, maybe have that for two or three years, and then they're ready to make the jump. Everyone's in a different situation. Everyone's personal situation is different. Not everybody wants to own a full EV. Everybody will one day, but they're not ready yet. And that's okay because cars like this are a, are a great solution because nearly all of their miles, if, if typical use case is anything to go by, typical commuter distances are anything to go by, most people will do most miles on electric. And when they enjoy the silence, when they enjoy the economy, certainly if they charge it at home overnight on cheap rate and they're not spending any money on fuel, all of a sudden they'll think, well, look, this has been easy peasy. The next car in three years' time, when it comes off the lease or whatever, is going to be a full electric car. Finally, some news from the Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi alliance, and I'm delighted to say this one isn't about politics or Carlos Ghosn or the alliance falling apart, not that it is, according to official statements or anything like that, but Alliance Ventures. And if you haven't heard of Alliance Ventures, well, you're not to blame. It's the venture capital arm of Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi alliance. They've just announced investment in an EV-related company. The company's called The Mobility House. It's been described as a technology company that provides a platform for integrating vehicle batteries into the power grid using intelligent charging energy and storage solutions, says Inside EVs. Well, a statement from the company said this, Alliance member companies and the Mobility House have already embarked on several projects together. For instance, through collaboration with the Mobility House, the Nissan Leaf was the first electric car to be used in a V2G vehicle-to-grid project in Germany. That's where you can pass energy from your car battery to the grid. Uh, That was with Group Renault as well. And the Mobility House is marketing the biggest stationary energy storage system ever made with EV batteries in Europe and contributing through its smart energy platform to make the Portuguese island of Porto Santo near Madeira the first ever smart island in the world. Link in the show notes if you want to read more. And that's just fabulous news about how EVs really are not just about getting you from A to B, but really are part of a clean energy solution going forward. Sorry for the buzzwords. I could have used the word mobility in there as well. Oh, e-mobility. Yeah, that's a good buzzword. Right, moving on to our question of the week this week. This is a contentious one. 
I knew it when I picked the question, and we went with this one. So talking to the gang at myev.com, I was talking about the audience figures for my YouTube channel, and it's 90% male. When I went along to Fully Charged, I was looking around going, there should be more women, more like strong female figureheads in this industry. Now look, there are some, and they are amazing. But you'd have to admit, if you've gone to an event, went to Fully Charged, if you look at my download stats, EVs are generally, at the moment, a guy thing. And I'd like to know why, because they shouldn't be. So give me your thoughts. Looking at the stats, certainly on this podcast, I don't think I'm like mini Jeremy Clarkson. We're not all talking about blokey stuff. This podcast, I would like to think, is kind of you know, gender neutral, if I can use that phrase. I'm not, I don't think I'm particularly biased either way. So why is the audience 90% men? Why EVs are generally a guy thing still? Because they they shouldn't be. But is there a reason? Let me know your thoughts. You can email me hello at evnewsdaily.com and I would love to hear from you on the Facebook and YouTube comments. Thank you so much to 230 patrons of the podcast. Your generosity keeps me going. And we have a brand new premium partner of the show. Former guest on this show and someone I turn to all the time for advice and technical expertise and that is avid technology if you've heard long time listeners of the podcast will have heard of avid avid technology make the bits that go inside evs and maybe it's the bits that you'll never see maybe it might not be for the car you drive on the road but there's going to be plenty of evs around commercial vehicles and other applications they make the bits the technology the ip that enables that to happen They are an incredible company. That's why I featured them on the podcast so long ago. Last month, they contacted me to say, hey, look, we would love to support your show if that would be okay with you. And of course, that would be okay with me. So thank you very much, Avid Technology, a new premium partner of the show. And I said, yes, of course, obviously I would love you to support the show, but you guys are such a wealth of information. I know they can't talk about specific examples because if they're working with specific manufacturers, automakers, companies, they can't, you know, they're under contract, they can't give specific names, but they can certainly answer our EV questions because they are, of all the companies in the world, in a unique position of understanding it better than almost anybody. And so a new feature coming to this podcast where you can, you as the listeners to the show, you can ask Avid anything you want about EVs. Thank you very much as well to Phil Roberts from Electric Future and Brad Crosby for supporting me as well. There are 514 previous shows online for free. If you'd like to download them, you can. The new ones come out every single day. You can get those first and free and automatically by hitting subscribe on your podcast app. Catch up on the socials by searching EV News Daily. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.